welcome to Aston Means Business, a podcast from Aston University. My name's Steve Dyson, and I'm a journalist who's interviewing a number of top business academics, as well as students and delegates who've developed their careers and businesses here at Aston. This podcast has been going since October 2019, and there are now more than 50 previous episodes that you can find and listen to by simply Googling Aston Means Business. In today's episode, I'm going to interview Frances Glover. She's the co-owner of A Natural Undertaking, an independent firm of undertakers in Kings Heath, Birmingham. A Natural Undertaking is a member of the Association of Green Undertakers, and it offers ethical and ecological choices of funerals as the norm for its clients. As part of the company's development, Frances has just participated in the Green Advantage Sustainability course run by Aston University. Hello, Francis. Hi, Steve. Lovely to talk to you. You too, Francis. Let's begin by finding out a bit more about yourself, Francis. Who are you? What were you doing before you co-founded a natural undertaking? And what made you want to become an undertaker? <laughs> Well, it certainly wasn't something I expected to do. And I think my family were quite shocked when, when it kind of happened. I've got quite a, a varied background, I suppose, going back kind of quite a way. Um, I graduated in law at Birmingham University, but decided that uh, that wasn't something I particularly felt too passionate about. And so after that, I worked in a variety of sales and marketing roles. I always felt it was quite important to have a passion for the product um, I was selling. So, you know, we're talking donuts, ice cream, beer, and then finally cho- <laughs> <laughs> chocolate at Cadbury. So, oh, you know, so, so, certainly lots of passion in all of those. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were definitely things that I felt like I could, um, I could sell and, and talk about and, and work with. Um, so probably one of the more important roles for me was at Cadbury, where my role was to bring brands into the new digital age. We did some really fun marketing campaigns since no one really understood this new world at the time. I mean, we were talking 2003, really. I basically became an internal consultant for the brands and helped people how to understand how we should be communicating with people and using digital for for everybody's benefit, really. I then left in 2009 and set up a small digital consultancy with a colleague and we ran that for six years we had some great clients great international clients um, worked on some brilliant projects but I kind of I think I turned 40 (laughs) does something to your brain and I just felt like I wasn't really doing anything useful I felt like I wasn't really contributing um, to the community I lived in for years I've been sort of living in Birmingham but commuting out So whether that was going to Burton-on-Trent or going to London or going abroad and I kind of just felt like I needed a bit more out of my life. So I guess that's where the sort of the the thoughts around um, funeral directing sort of came in. Although it wasn't until I started talking to my friend Carrie, who had said for years that she wanted to set up her own business and it had become quite a passion for her. She'd had some experiences that, you know, really stuck with her. And at that point, she said she needed to she needed to set up her funeral business so I said right I'm going to help you I'm going to help you set up we're going to do the milestones get your marketing plan in place and you'll be off and we had one meeting and we properly discussed what it was that she felt was kind of going on in the funeral industry and I went away just thinking oh my gosh you know there's really something interesting and exciting there um I know that sounds a bit weird (laughs) but in terms of you know, something that's not only wasn't being done nearby, but meant we could also actually help and really truly be a part of the community that we live in and contribute to that community. So that was it. So after that first meeting, we kind of, I just went back and said, yep, would you like, would you like me to help you? Would you like to do this together? And kind of that was it really. And we both had similar views about business and kept asking each other, why can't a business you know, be run for the good of everyone and everything. Obviously, we needed to run a business that gave us a living and fed our families. Um, but creating something that was good and honest and fair and that consider our, our environment and the people um, in it as well just felt really important to us. And so making green options accessible and not just a choice was quite crucial to us from the outset. 
nine years later, I sort of look at what we've created and how we've helped people. And I just, I just feel really proud. I think it's great. It sounds like you've got a lot of feeling for it, which is great. But tell us more about what a natural undertaking actually offers that is different from what we might call the traditional undertakers. I know it's sustainable. I know it's got green credentials. But what does that mean in practice? It's really interesting, isn't it? People look at us and they don't quite know how to describe us. I think some people call us alternative, but in a way, I feel that really belittles what we do. We offer the same services as other funeral directors. You know, we can collect people when they die out of hours. We have a proper mortuary and, you know, we've created lovely welcoming premises for people to come to. And we arrange cremations and burials just like any other traditional funeral director. But I suppose what we do is actively make sure that people know they have lots of options that they know a funeral can be whatever they need it to be and that could be simple it could be I don't know let's let's use the word Victorian maybe rather than traditional because that's basically what it is it could be bespoke and totally relevant to the person who's died or it could be more considerate of our environment and include greener options or the greener options could be included in any one of those other aspects that I've just listed. But I suppose our starting point is that we don't assume we know what people want. We start with a blank sheet of paper and we can be really flexible. So we're not tied to particular suppliers. We don't have a warehouse full of coffins that need to be sold. We don't have a huge fleet of vehicles um, that we need to have out on the road all the time. We work from the basis that we're human beings carrying out a very human service in our community Um, so we don't wear uniforms either that create any distance between us Um, we want people to feel that whatever choices they make they've been able to think them through and feel proud about them we want them to feel that they're making choices that are are natural to them Um, and it might include ways that family can participate during the run-up to and including the funeral or it might be to do with creating something that's more environmentally friendly. So for example, we don't embalm people unless it's absolutely necessary. We offer a range of coffins that are more environmentally friendly, and we make sure that people know that natural burial is available, um, or that there's even more sympathetic crematoria. We have um, Redditch Crematorium up the road from us, which um, uses the heat from the cremations to heat the local swimming pool next door. Oh, wow. (laughs) So, you know, there's there's kind of a variety of ways, but but it's about making sure that people know and understand and, and hear about all these different things. And we actually have electric hearses, you know, which we charge out at a lower cost than a traditional hearse. A green funeral, if it, let's just think about that um, terminology, really, for many people, uh, it, it probably sounds like the perfect way to arrange one's departure from the world. I mean, we're all watching and experiencing the impacts of climate change like never before. And so many of us are trying to make the right choice in becoming more sustainable wherever we can. Certainly speaking for myself, Francis, I I can't think of a better way to have as natural a funeral as possible to help the global um, battle against global warming. But it's not the right choice for everyone, is it? I mean, some people want an ornate coffin. Some relatives want or maybe even need a black hearse and the full procession of vehicles following and a burial and an organ that goes with it. Is that the case? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And for many people, when someone dies, carrying out that person's wishes, staying true to what they might have expected is really crucial in getting that last formal goodbye right. Um, and for, for the people who are left to, to be able to sort of grieve healthily if you like beyond that and that may mean having some of those things you've just mentioned for us helping people to do what's right for them is our priority so we offer all of those options but make it as easy as possible for other people to choose greener choices if they wish to you know sometimes people don't want to stray too far from what feels familiar especially at a time that is really unfamiliar when somebody dies you're in a completely different kind of zone so it may just be that the only thing that is different is that they have a wicker coffin and they still have the black hearse and the black limousines i'm i'm not so sure that many people are actively making greener choices partly because it's really hard to say what actually makes up a greener funeral i think at the moment people have a general sense of it would be good if we can do less harm but there are so many moving parts in a funeral, it's really hard to say exactly what combinations um, would be best. So 
most people want something that's more reflective of their lives, I think, something that's maybe softer, a little bit less formal. And the more natural choices often fit very well with, well with this. And I think people kind of feel better as a result of that, if that makes sense. Where people come to us with a strong view around wanting a greener funeral, then you know, typically that would look like maybe a wicker, wicker or a cardboard coffin at a natural burial ground using one of our electric hearses. You know, they would ensure that the person who has died is dressed in all natural cotton fabric. They would have very few cut flowers, certainly wouldn't have an oasis and a plastic display around the flowers and, and likely be kind of um, wild flowers that, that they've kind of used within those displays. But what's really interesting is that I have noticed, particularly this year, I think, people are becoming more aware of different things. So I don't know if you've heard of aquamation. Um, no. But aquamation or alkaline hydrolysis, as it's known, is kind of cremation by water rather than by fire. And yeah, and Carrie, Carrie and I actually visited the factory, gosh, it must have been about five years ago up in Leeds. And interesting, they've been exporting these machines around the world. But we're yet, we've been yet to sort of have a, a water company approve it in this country. I know Rowley Regis locally tried to apply for it um, a few years ago. There is one now, I believe, up in the north north that is, is kind of opening. And I think people are starting to kind of um, appreciate that this is going to happen and that that, that is, is worthwhile. So the way it works is that it uses water and some alkali, so like um, potassium hydroxide. It's heated to around 150 degrees centigrade. And that combination of heat pressure and chemicals break down the body tissue and dissolves it, it dissolves into the water and you're left with dna free clean water liquid oh, wow you're also left with an ash so people are worried well actually with cremation you get some ashes don't you that the family can can um, receive and maybe sprinkle or inter somewhere well you still get some a kind of ash but it, in theory it's probably better for the ground than the ash that comes out of a fire cremation as well but the, fascinating the key thing is that it it uses less than one fifth of the energy from gas or electricity than a traditional crematorium oh really yeah with less harmful gases going into the atmosphere so that's that's kind of one thing and we're, we're actually getting more people asking about it at the moment and saying um what is this you know is this is this happening but there's now also talk of um, something called organic reduction or lovingly known as human composting. I don't know if you've come across this one. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have heard of it, yeah. And it does yeah. sound odd, doesn't it? But yeah, yeah. why not? Yeah. Um, and actually, personally, this would be my preference. I know some people react quite strongly to the idea of it. But the good thing is that it is starting conversations now about how we deal with our bodies when we die and what the impact is on our planet. And that can only be a good thing. You know, all these conversations are going to start to change what people perceive a funeral should be made up of. So I think it's going to take a while, but I think we're going to continue to see changes in how funerals look for a long time yet, really. Yeah, it's really interesting. And um, one of the things that you mentioned a couple of times was your electric hearse. Tell me more about that and, and you know, how, how common they are, how easy it is to get them and, and what difference that makes. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, we were in 2017, we were one of the first independent funeral directors, one of the first funeral directors in the UK to to buy one. And as a company, looking back now, we were actually only three years old at the time. So I suppose it could have been a bit of a risk, especially as um, we wanted it to be white. And it looks completely different. So the first, that, that Nissan Leaf was, if, if you imagine a sort of a small little bubble of a car <laughs> and it's it's got a big window down one side, the two seats on the left-hand side of the car were taken out, the coffin goes into the back and then you have a driver and then a person sitting behind the driver. So it looks quite space agey actually. But being true to our, our principles and values has always been really important to us. So when we had the opportunity in 2017 to do that, we felt actually, you know, that was really important to us. So we bought the Nissan Leaf, had it converted. And it's been really fascinating to see people's reactions, actually. And people have been pretty wowed by it. Some people say, oh, no, you know, just completely wrong. And that's absolutely fine. You know, that's the whole point about having choices. Things, things are not always right for everybody. But it's lovely, you know, even now families are still coming to us saying that their relative had expressly asked for that particular car to be included. Yeah, oh, really? in their funeral. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And then last December, we took delivery of a second Nissan Leaf hearse. I guess the design has moved on since then and the conversion now makes it look more like a traditional hearse. So it's a it's a hearsey looking hearse, <laughs> but it's white. Again. It's white again. It is white. Still, a, I mean, a huge investment. The price had also gone up since um, 2017. But we felt it was, again, the right investment for us. It's, you know, electric still feels like the choice at the moment in terms of the right sort of vehicle to put on the road. And it gives this particular car gives families the option of an electric hearse while still feeling, I suppose, a greater sense of formality. So it has that because it has that sort of traditional hearsey kind of shape, you know, that I guess the first leaf def- definitely feels a little bit more casual. <laughs> In that sense. But to me, it sounds like so much like the right thing to do. But how easy is it in terms of cost, Francis? For instance, what's the difference between buying a Nissan Leaf and buying a traditional petrol driven hearse or diesel driven hearse? And, and what about the running costs? Also, what does it mean to the end consumer? Is a funeral in an electric car more or less expensive? Yeah, so I suppose if you mean the cost to us, um, the last Leaf was a huge investment for us. And we probably could have bought a petrol hearse more cheaply or uh, sort of if we went second hand or, you know, there would have been more available to us or, you know, similar for a, a kind of a, a, a traditional black hearse. But it, it just wasn't the right commercial decision for us as a business. In terms of running costs, I feel like they're less. I know electric has gone up. But you can charge overnight at lower tariffs. And, you know, if we install solar panels, then we could charge charge from them. So that's another kind of option that we've got as well. Currently, no road tax to pay. You can tell I'm not really a car freak, but um, there just seem to be less parts that go wrong on a electric <laughs> car. Okay. Unless, unless we've just been lucky. It certainly feels like we have, a, we have another vehicle, a collection vehicle, which is diesel and, and takes AdBlue. It certainly feels like that costs more fuel-wise. And of course, we have to pay road tax for that car. But we just, we just can't risk that vehicle being electric yet and we often have long distance collections that we have to make around the country and the infrastructure just doesn't feel robust enough to support us on that Mm, side of side of business yet in terms of the families who come to us you know we're we're just adamant that being green should be an easy choice so people shouldn't have to pay more to be greener it should be a natural choice rather than a premium choice so we hire ours out for 200 and 240 respectively and a petrol or diesel hearse will cost a family 265. If you want an alternative hearse such as a Land Rover hearse or a camper van that you know those start upwards from kind of 600 pounds really. So we're really trying to make this an affordable option for people and the thing is you know what's important for us is what it means for our community No car is pollution free, but we think we've saved around five tonnes of carbon emissions in the five years that we've had the first leaf. And, you know, we feel this can only double really with with the introduction of our second car. And, And we live and work in one of the most polluted cities in the UK. I remember my husband, he was he was a teacher recently sort of stopped teaching. But in the 25 years he was teaching, he talked about the incidence of allergies and asthma in his school that just grew hugely year on year. And just when we go back to our original aims when setting up our business, we wanted a business that not only delivered a service, which does good, but is run in such a way that we don't adversely affect the community that we operate in. So these electric hearses for us, as well as offering lots of other things, feel like at this point a way that one of the ways that we can help to deliver on our original aims of setting up our business. That that's great, and 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 I hear you talking about the sustainability side of things and how you know difficult it is um, to compare apples and pears. You know all the different data that's going on. With that in mind, how easy was it to set up a natural undertaking in terms of researching those more sustainable ways of doing things, finding the choices that worked, and making the whole operation as green as possible? What what guided you? <laughs> I got to say, when we started new, nine years ago, researching anything to do with funerals was pretty difficult. Even trying to find funeral directors' prices on their websites was was nigh on impossible. Um, and we were one of the first to put our prices clearly on our website when we built it. But from a sustainability point of view, though, 
I guess, you know, we started talking to people at there was the, there's the Natural Death Centre who've been around for a while and we joined the Association of Green Funeral Directors. So that kind of gave us a starting point and we started to find like-minded people around the country that we could talk to. And that pointed us in the right direction, I guess, of kind of suppliers who were out there. And there were, at that point, there were a few key, key suppliers of wicker and cardboard coffins. And the choice was still is kind of imported wicker and other natural materials or English willow. What's so frustrating is that English willow coffins are more expensive than the imported coffins. Although obviously in the last couple of years with all the price changes and price increases, you know, that gap is actually, you know, getting slightly smaller. But since then, you know, a bigger number. So it's nine years ago, since then, a number of suppliers have opened up. And within that, a variety even of cardboard coffin manufacturers. So now, you can choose a coffin that looks like cardboard and is made of something called EnviroBoard. And it's said to produce up to 87% less greenhouse gases than MDF when cremated and use up to 80% fewer trees. So there are more and more ways that we can start to sort of help people to choose more environmental options. I suppose the challenge with funerals, as I think I mentioned earlier, is that there are so many different factors which can affect the can I say greenness if I just made up a word? The greenness, yes. the greenness <laughs> of your funeral. <laughs> um, so, you know, who's to say that if you have a local cremation with a few attendees, just a few people there using an EnviroBoard coffin is more or less or less environmentally friendly than, say, a large gathering at an out-of-town burial ground using an imported wicker coffin? We just don't really know at the moment. Some research is starting, but I think we're still in the realms of using our common sense mostly at the moment. And I think the biggest challenge really lies with what people perceive to be, I don't know, a dignified funeral. I sort of don't like using that word dignified, but it, 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 a lot of people kind of return to that in terms of when they feel like they need to they need to carry something out for somebody who's died. And, you know, so what, how people perceive a dignified funeral and how willing they are to change those perceptions first. You know, if you think about it, in normal day-to-day -day activities, emotions often overrule our heads. So we often make decisions that we know we shouldn't quite make. And when somebody has died, that, imp that emotional impulse is just so much stronger. You don't always make the kind of decisions you would, you would normally make. So I think it is that sort of deep-seated sense of what a funeral looks like, which is probably one of the biggest challenges for us. And I guess, you know, whilst we've been using our common sense as a business and introduced things like electric hearses and broader coffins and burial options, we've been aware that there may be more we can do as a business overall to try and reduce our footprint on the world, which is why attending the Green Advantage course at Aston University this year came at such a good time for us, really. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because part of your sustainable business development is obviously going to be affected by what you learned on that Green Advantage course. Um, what was involved in that at Aston University and how has it helped you at a natural undertaking? Oh, yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, I actually, actually really enjoyed telling people that I was going back to university for a bit as well. That was quite nice. It's been a while. <laughs> but it was, it was a 12-week course. And for most people who are running a business, this might seem like a lot of time. But I think the course designers really understand what a tricky bunch business owners can be to pin down sometimes. And so the way they scheduled the sessions was brilliant. All I needed to do was commit to a couple of hours on a weekly and sometimes bi-weekly basis. If I wanted to do more work outside of this than I could, and I was allocated a mentor that I could talk to during planned sessions for around six weeks of the program, which was just brilliant. And I would say to anyone, you know, always take advantage of that, that kind of um, service that's offered to you. The benefits, I think, are huge attending a course like the Green Advantage course. We don't generally take time to force ourselves to look at, at you know, at a business when the, biz the demands of the business are generally so much, so great, that to make that time to force yourself to look at that topic for a serious length of time is just invaluable. And being on a course with a formal structure can really help you to do that, especially one that's not too demanding of your time. I think being able to talk to other business owners who are pondering the same question has just been invaluable. It was brilliant just chatting to other people who are thinking about the same things and just trying to work out the best the best options. You know, it sort of raises questions as well that for you that you hadn't even considered maybe, which is which gives you helps give you that kind of bigger picture. 
and and really being given access to experts throughout the university and people who've already been on the course just gave us real insights into what we can do practically to implement things in our business and that's the thing isn't it it's like you can talk about all of these things to the nth degree but actually if you don't really have any good ways to to go up take those away and do anything with then it's kind of been pointless and I certainly don't feel like that from from this particular course occasionally we had online sessions but I personally preferred the face-to-face ones um I guess other people have other views on that I I think that you can't really replace proper contact with (laughs) with human beings and a big takeout uh for me for the course was that yes you know it's a huge topic but as individuals and businesses, if we can all do our little bit, then as a group, as a group, you know, small businesses all doing this at the same time, then actually that little bit will add up to a hell of a lot for our planet. The course gave us a lot to think about, not only how we go about presenting our services, um, but also what we need to do behind the scenes. So we've come away from the process. We've started the Greener Globes process. That's like a a process for funeral directors which recognizes their steps to becoming more sustainable as organizations and we've also been working with a consultant who's been looking at what we need to do in relation to making our physical premises more sustainable Um, and also how we might benchmark and report our progress in reducing our carbon emissions over the years to come so we're just waiting on the kind of final report really we'll be reviewing that we know it's not going to be a quick fix. We know there's going to be, you know, a lot. We know it's going to be costly, potentially. But understanding what we're looking at is the first step. And then building a plan for it um, feels like it will be a major step forward for us and something that we just feel is is absolutely right for us to do. And, you know, the course at Aston has, has been instrumental in, in kind of putting us into that position, I suppose. 12 weeks on a course, it's quite a commitment for a small businesswoman. Was it worth it? For me personally, yes. I only ever want to do something that I feel passionate about. And looking at how I can help reduce emissions will certainly help me sleep at night. So one of the things that, you know, kind of, I suppose, ticks some boxes for me personally. From a business point of view, as I've said, there's definitely a cost to it. But I think that Carrie and I have already shown that closely aligning our actions with our values um, has a huge benefit to our overall business. Um, The two are intertwined. We can't build a sustainable business without first being sustainable. Finally, Francis, given that you've been running a natural undertaking for nine years, I'm sure anyone listening would be fascinated in any advice that you might have for other small businesses who want to focus on and commit to sustainable development. Just as an outtake, what would be your top three tips? Ah, well, I think, um, firstly, I would say don't get too overwhelmed. Um, It's all too easily to think, gosh, you know, everything's a disaster and, you know, we're beyond the tipping point and all of those kind of things. But actually, you know, there are things we can do. And I would say tackle the things that you can do easily first. Um, something is always better than nothing and make make a plan that feels achievable in terms of you know making sure that you don't get overwhelmed I would say talk to other business owners there may be ways ways that you can share your sustainable development plans together take advantage of the courses run like you know run by Aston University and other places like that and then also thirdly I think my third one would be don't forget that sustainable isn't just about environmental issues. You know, look after your employees too, making sure that the people who work with you are looked after and cared for too. So yeah, those are my three. (laughs) Francis Glover, co-owner and undertaker of A Natural Undertaking. Many thanks for taking part in this episode of Aston Means Business. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me. And thanks to you, our audience, for listening to Aston Means Business, an original podcast series for Aston University. Remember, if you enjoyed today's episode, you can find and listen to earlier episodes by simply Googling Aston Means Business. And if you're interested in the Green Advantage course that Francis went on at Aston University, the programme is now recruiting businesses for cohorts six and seven, starting in September and October this year. 
To find out more, simply Google Green Advantage Aston. Meanwhile, we'll be back soon with more interviews with some of the top business academics, students and delegates here at Aston University. Aston means business. Thanks for listening.